The Great Lakes are the largest freshwater lakes of our time. They cover an area of 244,106 square kilometers and hold an estimated 6 quadrillion gallons of water. The Great Lakes are a source of economic prosperity through the use of shipping for ore and wood products, and they are also a hotspot for tourism. Recently, however, there has been much concern over the amount of fresh water within the lakes and where all this fresh water is going. This video presentation is about one of the driving forces of the change in the Great Lakes water level, and it's called the Geological Isostatic Adjustment. Now you may ask yourself, what is Geological Isostatic Adjustment? Geological Isostatic Adjustment occurs when a really heavy object, such as the Laurentide Ice Sheet, that covered much of North America during the last Ice Age, is placed on the Earth's crust. The weight of this ice sheet causes the crust to be forced downwards and outwards from the sheet. This means that there will be a displacement of the crust on the outer edges of the ice sheet. It is only after the ice sheet has melted that this land can start to shift back to its original state. This process of adjustment takes hundreds of thousands of years and is actually currently still occurring. At a rate of approximately 5.6 centimeters of uplift per century around Lake Michigan here in the north and a rate of 7.5 centimeters of subduction per century around Lake Ontario in the south. This shows that there is tilting of the Earth's crust towards where the ice sheet melted from. Imagine you could travel back in time 15,000 years and view the Earth during the time of the last great ice age. You would see that the Great Lakes region would be completely buried in a thick ice sheet. This ice sheet helped carve out the basins of the lakes and fill them with water. But to truly understand how the Great Lakes were formed, we have to go further back in time. The foundation that created the Great Lakes Basin was laid over a billion years ago, when two previously fused tectonic plates broke apart creating two rift valleys known as the Mid-Continental Rift and the St. Lawrence Rift. But the region didn't become flooded until the end of the Ice Age approximately 10,000 years ago. Approximately 14,000 years ago, the Laurentide Ice Sheet covering North America began to recede and its meltwater began to fill the Great Lakes Basin to create a lake known now as Lake Algonquin. This lake covered much larger surface area than the upper Great Lakes, whereas Lake Erie and Ontario at this point in time had less volume than they did today. Why did Lakes Erie and Ontario contain less water even though there was a continental glacier melting in their neighborhood? Well, this was due to geological isostatic adjustment. At this time, the ice sheet was only just receding, and therefore the areas to the south were at a higher elevation than those to the north. This means that the meltwater from the glacier would take the path of least resistance. Over an approximate period of 7,300 years, this path changed based on the rate of rebound in the region. Initially, 11,600 years ago, Lake Algonquin drained into the Kirkfield Outlet, which is noticeably the core of the lakes region to the region east of Lake Simcoe. At this time, Kempenfeld Bay, which is now part of Lake Simcoe, is thought to have been carved out by meltwater headed to the core of the lakes region, which would then connect with water leaving Lake Ontario and exit the St. Lawrence Seaway to the Atlantic Ocean. Approximately 11,000 years ago, this path changed its course again, as isostatic uplift closed the connection with the Kirkfield Outlet, as well as the removal of a block of ice to the north at Mink Lake. This allowed for the water to change course through the north at the Petawawa River and subsequently dumping into the Ottawa River and again into the St. Lawrence where it would return to the Atlantic Ocean. By approximately 10,300 years ago this path was now located running from the French River through Lake Nipissing to the Ottawa River. Also the water levels in the upper Great Lakes at this time had subsided to their lowest points since the Ice Age. Lake Huron was now broken into several distinct lakes due to a a ridge running east to west from Amberley, Ontario to Alpena, Michigan. Also, the Niagara Escarpment divides Lake Huron from Turbomurray to Manitoulin Island. At this time, Lake Michigan was divided into two individual lakes and was connected to Lake Huron by a post-glacial river at the Straits of Mackinac. Notably, at this time, Turbomurray was home to a waterfall larger in both size and volume than Niagara Falls is today. Lakes Erie and Ontario at this time were continuously rising and spreading westwards. By 8,000 years, an influx of water from Lake Superior along with paleoclimatic events allows for lake levels to begin to rise in Lake Huron, Michigan, 
as well as the creation of Lake St. Clair. However, water in the upper Great Lakes still channels through the North Bay Outlet. Lake Superior is now full of meltwater, which channels into Lake Huron through the area around the St. Mary's River. Between 4,500 and 4,000 years ago, changes due to isostatic uplift closed the North Bay Outlet. Uplifting at the St. Mary's River also separates Lake Superior from Lake Huron. During this time, the water starts its flow southward from the St. Clair River, filling Lake St. Clair, and the overflow continues down the Detroit River into Lake Erie. From here, the water maintains its usual course over Niagara Falls into Lake Ontario and into the St. Lawrence River, where it finally enters the Atlantic Ocean. Isostatic uplift nowadays continues to change lake levels. However, this changes only in cubic centimeters per century. Current GPS beacons and flow rate monitors show that Lake Michigan Huron is decanting its water into the lower Great Lakes. This is partially due to isostatic uplift. However, the good news is, is that the lower Great Lakes show signs that they are storing water, and Lake Superior shows no signs of an increase or decrease in their water levels. Many Great Lakes shipping companies and federal agencies are worried that water levels in the Great Lakes are lowering so much that the future of shipping is an uneasy one. However, research has shown that they are themselves may be to blame due to sedimentation within the Great Lakes from prop wash. However, it can still be difficult to determine who is to blame for the sedimentation as they point fingers at the agriculture and the farmers point their fingers at the cities. This discussion, however, is another topic for another in-depth overview, which alas is probably best saved for another time. On the topic of isostatic uplift, causing changes in the Great Lakes, it is a proven fact that isostatic uplift does cause water levels to fluctuate. However, that rate of change occurs over a geological time period. That meaning its effects are generations away from being noticed. As stated at the beginning of the video, we have roughly six quadrillion gallons of water estimated to be in the Great Lakes, and only five to seven cubic centimeters being displaced from isos isostatic uplift per shoreline per century and we haven't even factored in the rate of recharge per annum. Clearly, geology is not to blame for our water problems. Lake Huron rolls a billion seas In the rooms of the ice water mansion Michigan's dreams like a young man's dreams The islands and days are the sportsman Farther below Lake Ontario Takes in what Lake Erie center and The iron boats go as the mariners long low With the gales of November remembered In a musty old hall in Detroit, they prayed in a maritime sailor's cathedral. The church bell chimed till it rang twenty-nine times for each man on the Edmund Fitzgerald. The legend lives on from the Chippewa down of the big lake they call.